Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Rowan Trouncer. I'm the marketing manager here at Vention. I'd like to give you all a very warm welcome to, to this month's webinar, this week's webinar. Uh, it's gonna be based around cobalt palletizers and how you can best evaluate uh, cobalt palletizers and automate your uh, palletizing operations. I'm joined here with Patrick Tawaji, the product line manager here at Vention. Um, and we've had a little bit of, of difficulties getting this webinar together with COVID and the restrictions that we have here in Montreal. Um, so we've actually recorded one yesterday, so we'll be playing that for the first 30 minutes of the session, uh, and then Patrick and myself will be here afterwards to, to answer any questions that you have, and we'll be on the, the chat line as well. So feel free to, to punch it in uh, as you think of it, and then we can get to it uh, as quickly as can be. I will start this video, and um, we can get straight into it. Hello, everyone. I'm here on our applications lab at Vention. I'm excited to share today's topic, which is going to be around automating your palletizing operation. And we'll be specifically taking a look at a relatively new entrant uh, to the field of automated palletizing, so cobalt palletizers. So we'll uh, take a look into some considerations about evaluating cobalt palletizers. A bit more about myself. So I'm Patrick Tawanji. I'm the product line manager for applications here at Vention. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to uh, keep up to date with some progress on applications here at Vention. Um, I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions you have as well offline. A bit more about Vention um, and what applications is as well. So Vention um, is what we describe as a manufacturing automation platform. Uh, so we're founded in 2016. Um, you can see a few of the stats here about the number of users that we have on the platform and the number of customers that we've been fortunate enough to serve, uh, as well as all these modular automation components that we have on that platform. And the whole idea of the platform is to provide digital engineering tools at every step of the process for an automating uh, your factory floor, right? So for a industrial automation project, so any, through from design to automation to ordering and deployment, um, Vention has a tool at every step of the way. The agenda for today, so specifically looking at palletizers again. So we'll be looking at um, a brief introduction just to contextualize a bit uh, how we think about palletizing and the reasons why uh, you would go around palletizing your systems. Um, we'll look at automated palletizing systems in general. So what's been traditionally on the market, uh, the limitations of those obviously present a bit more on cobalt palletizers like we see in that image here. And like you can see behind me um, in our lab actually. We'll look at pallet configuration software. So this is something that's uh, fairly important as a user, as an end customer for one of these systems, because that's how you're probably going to be interacting with the system a lot um, from an operator perspective. So reconfiguring the system for new products and new pallets. And we'll take a look at some important considerations as well. Um, since this is a relatively new entrant, uh, the cobalt palletizers, there are some considerations that will come up, whether from features or just uh, physical limitations of the system or physical added features of the system uh, that you might want to just consider if you're looking at deploying a cobalt palletizer. And finally, we'll take a look at a few things to keep in mind if you're evaluating a project, and we'll wrap things up actually looking at some projects from the field. So as an introduction, uh, just to situate where palletizers are in a manufacturing process on a palletizing line. Um, so this is an end line packaging process. Um, obviously, this is a very automated system. Uh, so you can, you know, a lot of different businesses will not have something that's this sophisticated, uh, all the way from case packing to case sealing to case forming, um, bring it over to the automated palletizer, which we've highlighted here, maybe even with some pallet conveyors uh, where you have some pallet wrapping at the end. Um, so where, what we're going to be focusing on is this automated palletizing step, right? So the cases or bags or whatever have been formed, they're being brought to a cell um, in a structured way, and then we're going to put them obviously on a pallet so that they're ready for shipment, right? And the reasons why you might have to automate these, this is the things that we've come across most often and what we see um, in the market. So obviously there are labor shortages, right? So just being able to find labor for this relatively low value task, um, in a very competitive market, that's a huge challenge. We're very aware of that. Uh, injuries as well, just the nature of the process. So when boxes are lighter, they tend to be coming out faster. It can be tough to keep up with them with the pace of it. Um, and when they're heavier, uh, well, that just poses a, a risk in and of itself, right? Just having to bend down uh, with a heavy load like that can um, create injuries uh, at the back, 
right? Uh, so obviously there are implications with workers comp and things like that. It's very repetitive. Uh, palletizing is, you know, you might be changing products, but you're usually going to be doing a production run of probably a few thousands of boxes or cases or whatever it is coming through. Uh, so it's very repetitive, right? Easy to make mistakes, not very engaging for an operator. Again, in a competitive labor market, um, that's going to be something where if you want to retain labor, um, might be a concern. Uh, it's also disruptive at lower throughputs. So if we think of a line um, that's producing maybe two to four cases per minute, it's easy to kind of picture how, you know, having an operator there waiting for a box that's coming, you know, every 10 to 15 seconds, they're probably not going to stand around there for two minutes. They're probably going to let the boxes pile up, go do something else. And then when they come back to clear that queue um, after a couple of minutes, you know, they're going to have to be task switching between whatever else they're doing on the line and then back to the palletizing process. So it's pretty disruptive, right? They're not able to get into a task for longer than a couple of minutes. And all of that task switching also can lead to a higher chance of errors, all right? And then finally, at higher throughput lines, well, labor can potentially just not keep up with the pace uh, of palletizing. And that's actually, you know, pretty, probably the most traditional reason for, for palletizing a, a process is just you're increasing production production past the point where labor can keep up with the throughput. Um, so you're going to look at an automated palletizing system. In terms of the types of systems that exist on the market, um, we look at what are the main configurations at a high level. So what's been around traditionally have been these conventional palletizers on the left here, also known as Cartesian or gantry palletizers uh, or row or layer type palletizers. So these are linear systems. Um, I'll, I'll touch on those a bit more in, in, in a subsequent slide. Um, but those have been systems that have existed on the market, you know, probably since the very beginning of automated palletizing. And then we have robotic palletizers. So once these robot arms came in, they got big enough, fast enough, strong enough uh, to be able to do this type of process. Um, we started seeing robotic arms, which again, added a few um, features and benefits in terms of flexibility and things like that. And alternative names, especially in North America, uh, we see FANUC palletizer because uh, it's, it's so widely used in industry. A cobot palletizer that we'll touch on is a subcategory technically of a robotic palletizer. You'll hear it called industrial robot palletizer too. Industrial being um, distinctive from collaborative or for, for cobot palletizer. And you also have this special case that I won't touch on too, too much, um, but of a hybrid palletizer where you actually have something that looks like a convention palletizer, like on the left here, uh, but with a robot actually forming the, the layers. Um, and then having a Cartesian or gantry system actually stacking the layers one by one uh, once they're formed. And there are advantages to that, but uh, we won't go into that too much today. So these conventional palletizers, uh, like I mentioned, will do things case by case, box by box, or sometimes you'll have a special end of arm tooling that will do uh, multiple cases per pick. Uh, they can also do entire rows at a time, right? If you're able to have some kind of mechanism to form them in exactly the pattern that you want and then drop them down onto the pallet. On a system like this, big advantage is there's virtually no payload or reach limitations, right? You're just gonna build the system, the gantry to your desired spec. You're gonna make it long enough, tall enough. You're gonna use strong enough motors. Um, the end of arm tooling is not really gonna have a restriction because that's gonna factor into your design. And if you need more juice, well, you're either just gonna use a bigger motor, bigger actuator, more motors. Um, so this is really a system when you look at the really, really heavy payloads, uh, this is what you'd be looking at, all right? Uh, and a Vention Cartesian palletizer, like we see over here, uh, while at the lower end of throughput, so about five picks per minute, um, gives you something that's extremely cost effective. Uh, so we do these types of gantry palletizer systems as well uh, for heavier payloads. And the stacking rate is going to be highly variable in these different subtypes, right? So if you have a single uh, pick per minute or a single case by case type example, uh, you're going to be more in that, you know, five to 15 cases per minute. Um, and then when you go into the more sophisticated systems that can do entire rows at a time, uh, you can be pushing a performance of 50 plus cases per minute, right? For those high throughput lines, uh, less cost effectively, but you get the performance. In the robotic or industrial robot palletizers, um, these can form rows, uh, either case by case or um, multiple cases per pick. Again, so similar to the, uh, the conventional palletizers, it's gonna be, a, again, a function of the in-feed conveyor design and the gripper design. Uh, there's gonna be a more pronounced trade-off here between the payload, the reach, the cost, and the lead time. 
Um, there are a few different types of robot models that are more suited for palletizers. Uh, they're in hot demand, especially right now. So lead time is a great concern. If you're going into other models that are maybe not traditionally made for palletizing, um, you're, you might be looking at a bit of performance sacrifice, maybe a bit of additional cost. Um, and then finally, with these robots, there is going to be a limitation in terms of how far they can actually reach, right? That's going to have an impact on uh, the number of pallets you can do, the size of the product you can do, how tall you can stack it. Um, so that payload and reach kind of trade off, right? How heavy is the end of arm tooling? And what does that mean that the robot can still have as an effective payload for the product? All, all these things kind of come into play a bit more when you talk about robot type palletizers. So there's a, there's a bit of validation to do there um, whenever we're talking about robot palletizers. Uh, and they will have typically, depending on the robot arm, a more clearly defined upper range in terms of performance, specifically with payload and reach. The um, stacking rate is also highly variable. Again, it depends a lot on the robot arm and your, your method for gripping the product um, based on the end of arm tooling design and the infeed. Uh, so again, you're going to find highly variable from systems that will do five to, again, over 50 cases per minute if you're doing entire uh, multi multiple cases per pick. So some common challenges that we see with these conventional and robotic palletizers that have been traditionally on the market is that they are typically designed for the vast majority of solutions on the market for large and high throughput facilities. And that creates challenges for small to medium sized enterprises or SMEs or facilities and plants that have lower throughput lines, which we'll define as about under 12 cases per minute. Uh, because they're so big and so expensive, right? There's this large footprint that you might not want be able to put in the context of a line of that size with a lower throughput. Um, they're gonna be higher costs. So obviously just based on the number of operators uh, that you might be displacing elsewhere in the plant, uh, the return on investment is just not gonna be as interesting. They're not gonna be as flexible. Uh, robot palletizers, even the industrial ones can be fairly flexible, uh, might be a little tough to reconfigure. Uh, but then on the conventional palletizers, those will definitely be harder to move around from one line to the other, right? I mean, that's a full teardown and needing to build it back up. Um, so less flexible. Uh, they'll be able to do different types of products, but moving from one location to another and having that flexibility uh, is going to be a limitation with these types of more traditional solutions. And another thing to keep in mind is that these really high-end solutions uh, will require a lot of outsourcing both in terms of installation, configuration, um, in terms of doing switchovers between products and pallet types, uh, in terms of maintenance and in terms of training, you're gonna have to have a fully dedicated team, probably at an external company, unless you decide to have that expertise in-house, which again is pretty high, uh, high overhead. Um, so there's gonna be, require probably some kind of outsourcing in terms of just being able to you know, conceive of having these types of machines in-house at your facility which again is probably going to be a bit of a challenge for a lot of SMEs because that's just not something that is within the realm of possibilities. So enter this relatively uh, new class of palletizers, right? Collaborative robot palletizers or cobot palletizers, which have been around for about 10 years, right? Since cobots uh, started, although these, these cobot type palletizers have really started to take off probably more in the last four or five years. Um, and so what we have at Vention is uh, two types actually. So a standard one built on a smaller type of cobot and these large cobot palletizers with a larger type of cobot. And what they're able to provide is a more flexible cost effect, uh, effective solution, especially for those types of lines where you're gonna have lower throughput or floors where, you know, this is a facility that's growing. It's a facility where where production lines, um, you know, you might be running one one day, one another day, and you need a system that you can actually flexibly bring from one location to another uh, and be able to reconfigure yourself without needing to have an external party that you're outsourcing to come in and do it. Um, so doing something on a semi-regular basis like that in terms of reconfiguration, these systems are going to fit in great, right? And they're smaller, obviously, as well. They're going to take less space in a lot of different scenarios. Um, so that's going to reduce cost um, at the end of the day and make this actually a viable option for a lot of those systems, uh, like we were saying, uh, below about 12 cases per minute that were previously didn't really have a, a solution that was right sized for the problem, right? And although this footprint is lower, right, I mentioned that overall the footprint is lower, some form of safety is still required 
you know, I know we talk a lot about collaborative, uh, but above a certain speed with a certain payload, right? There is still going to be uh, that that danger that something can uh, hit an operator that's going to be in the vicinity. So anything about above about three to four cases per minute, safety is still going to be required around the cell. Um, but because of the collaborative nature of the robots, you can actually do things like speed and separation monitoring with having fence lift safety um, and things like this. So. Uh, that allows you to be very flexible, um, actually, and, and have a lot of different options, actually, in, in terms of how you're going to um, configure the safety. And a bit more details on those two types of uh, palletizers, cobalt palletizers here. Uh, so the ones on the left, um, these kind of standard configurations built on either universal robots, UR10E, or a FANUC CRX, uh, they can handle cases up to about 18 pounds, right, in that class of cobalt. And you'll see rates up to about 12, 8 picks per minute. So I say picks here because if you were doing multiple picks per minute with, you know, say a product that was about half the, the maximum payload, so nine pounds, uh, you'd actually be able to do 16 cases per minute, right? So the math there, again, depends on the exact case-by-case -case, uh, project. And with the large cobalt palletizers, these leverage a Doosan H series. Um, there's a couple of models there, the H2017 or the H2515. Uh, these guys can do cases up to about 50 pounds. Um, so definitely a, a big payload increase here um, with a rate that's very similar at about 7.5 picks per minute with, again, multi-picking uh, being an option uh, so that you can get to those higher, slightly higher throughputs. I, I want to touch on um, uh, some pallet configuration software considerations as well. Um, so like I was saying, when you have a system like this, one of the main ways that you're going to be interacting with it is doing changeovers between products uh, on different production runs. So this pallet configuration software is important, especially if it's something that's going to be flexible that you want to be able to reconfigure yourself and redeploy. Um, it's going to have to be something that you can use entirely independently in-house. So there's a few different ways that we can split up you know, the different types of programming that you have available for these pallet configurations. So there's obviously just hard coded, right? So having uh, a system specialist, whether in-house or an external integrator um, come and program every single pallet SKU or box SKU that you have, right? The limitation with that is that every time you wanna do any type of change, whether it's to your pattern layout or your box size or having a new product being introduced to the line, you're going to have to ask that person to come back and do the hard coding again for a new configuration, right? Or have that, that team in-house that you're just going to keep. Uh, and obviously, you got to keep those folks busy. So they kind of have to be able to uh, do other things as well that are going to be adding value um, in terms of automating the plan, which again, maybe a bit more challenging at a, at a small to medium sized enterprise. There are solutions that are semi-configurable. Uh, they're they're going to be very powerful and feature rich. Um, they're going to require some more expensive uh, offline software, right? So it's not, not going to be something that you're necessarily going to do on the machine. Um, it's still going to require a decent amount of training and probably a bit of um, configuration on the physical layout of the machine in order to be able to uh, use it successfully. Um, but it is going to be code free, right? It's not going to be something that's hard coded where you actually have to go program every single robot move. Uh, you're going to be able to use something fairly graphical to do it just with those limitations of cost um, and having something that's going to probably require some kind of physical reconfiguration uh, when you go to the machine uh, to put the new program on it. And finally, we have this fully configurable type of situation. And this is actually a screenshot of the Vention app uh, for palletizing. Um, again, it's code free, like semi-configurable. Uh, what it's going to offer is, is really an app-like experience, right? Like we've come to expect from, uh, you know, just all the new types of technologies that have, have popped up, having this app-like experience that's a lot more intuitive from a UI UX perspective, um, we've found gets a lot better buy-in from operators that are going to need to be using this machine day in and day out. Um, and so what's great with that is that an operator or production manager can actually go into the system uh, directly on the teach pendant and manage, create, edit, uh, select their own palette recipes, their own palette configurations independently, right? So, you know, getting trained initially means that you can then be almost entirely independent afterwards in terms of being able to operate and use the machine. So if you're running a production run one day and then, you know, that ends at 4 p.m. and you want to switch over the machine to get it ready for the next shift, there doesn't need to be uh, any sort of major changeover. It's just as easy as selecting a new pallet recipe. And one of the big things that we've seen actually is customers that have maybe, you know, a couple of hundreds of different box SKUs. You might not want to front load the programming of all of those in terms of creating all of those recipes. Very tedious. Um, 
might take a couple of weeks of just you know sitting down and doing the work but if you're able to do this on the fly so every time there is a new pro production run coming you can just look at the sheet see hey what box is coming through what's the pattern that i need to do the operator can just program it as part of the setup of the line before they they, they start the production run um, and then you can slowly build that database just kind of organically and having those palette skews and those box skews it's extremely flexible that way all right, so it also gives you that option of being able to build up your capability and your library of palettes over time. And just a, a bit of a deeper look at what Vention's palette configurator looks like, which it's an open access tool. Actually, you can access it directly at this URL that we show here on our website um, without even signing up for an account. And what you can do is actually uh, create your own palette patterns in an entirely graphical way, like we're seeing here. So if you have a very specific layout that you're trying to meet, uh, this is a great way to do it or there's actually an auto layout functionality too. So if you don't have a specific pattern and it's a new SKU and you just wanna see, hey, I wanna optimize how many boxes I can put Polar, we have an auto layout tool that's actually gonna give you the minimum surface area left over for the product that you have, right? So kind of these smart design tools for palette configuration that can help you go faster as well. And once you've created all of your palettes, you can just come to the main operator UI over here. So kind of a selection screen, um, and a, a kind of an overview screen as well once the machine is running to let you know what state of the process you're at. You can also demo this online. And this is what an operator would essentially use, right? Once your library of boxes and stacks has been fully created, you basically just come to this select parameters list. You can search or just scroll through and you'd basically just be able to find the product that you wanna run. And once you select that, there's no physical reconfiguration or anything like that. You basically just select the products, run them, um, and that's about it. I mean, that's, as, that's how easy a product changeover can be with these cobot palletizer type systems. So some other important considerations, uh, and the reason we wanna cover this is because since this is a relatively new type of product, uh, there are some considerations that did not used to come into play uh, that are important here that you should be aware of if you're considering a cobot palletizer system, both in terms of extra functionality and limitations versus more traditional systems. And so one of the big ones is gonna be around end of arm tooling. Right. So on the traditional systems that are very high payload, very large systems, uh, these you can put a gripper or end of arm tool that can grip just about anything as long as you give it enough airflow if you make a complex enough mechanical structure around it. Right. The cobots, by nature of being lower inertia, lower mass, they're going to have a more limited payload. So they might require a bit more validation in order to optimize the exact type of gripper that you're going to want to use to get a consistent pick of your product every single time. And that's really gonna be extremely key because if you can't pick up your product every single time and guarantee that, you're gonna have a lot of operator interaction in terms of you know, fixing boxes that kind of failed in the production run uh, to ensure that you get a clean pallet at the end of the day, all right? And just to show you a way that you have these different options, <clears throat> um, depending on the product type uh, that you might have. So, um, whether it's bags, you can have these mechanical grippers or these vacuum bag, bag grippers. Again, a bit more suited for larger systems. Um, there are suction cups that can be used that are taken a bit more from case packing uh, type situations uh, that can be used for palletizing bags. Uh, although it's a little rare to find you know, small bags uh, that are gonna be palletized. Um, for corrugated cardboard boxes, uh, so you have a couple of options for lighter boxes under 10 kilos, whether it's something that's uh, electrically powered suction, uh, so, which is great because you don't need an external air supply, so it can really be a standalone system. You just provide it, you know, 110 volts and it's good to go. Um, for heavier um, or different types of product, uh, though, you might want to go with a Venturi form type gripper, so something where you have to provide uh, compressed air. Those are typically going to have a slightly higher uh, lifting capacity, especially if a very porous material uh, that might be good or something that has a, a surface area that changes from product to product. Foam is extremely flexible that way. When you have corrugated boxers that get heavier, so let's say above 10 kilos, you're going to want something that's a larger area. Right? So uh, at Vention, we like to use a couple of these types of foam grippers in conjunction so that we cover a larger surface area. Uh, or there are these larger area, heavy duty Venturi foam grippers uh, that you can use as well. Right? And so what's great with these is um, they cover a larger surface area, but they are gonna be a little hungrier in terms of the air that they consume. Uh, and they all, the, the gripper itself actually weighs a bit more. So uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. Right? So just in terms of having to validate to make sure that 
I can still grip the product really consistently, but the cobot is going to be able to lift the product still. Um, always something that you have to keep in mind here. And this is something that Vention can help with, actually. So um, here in this applications lab and in a couple of the rooms over, uh, we keep a full array of these types of rippers. Uh, so we're actually able to take your products, right? Send them to us. We'll pre-validate them, uh, no additional costs, so that we can make sure that the system that you get is going to have a gripper that is suitable for your range of products, all right? Going into even larger products, so let's say corrugated boxes over 25 kilos, uh, you're going to see suction cups um, being used here as well. So you can get really clever with suction cups. They can lift just about anything, especially Venturi type. Uh, but if you have a large range of SKUs, different surface areas, this is something where you're going to have to get really clever in terms of if I have a small product and then a big product, well, I'm going to have these suction cups that are kind of useless when I'm using the so smaller product. Um, so just having to optimize that type of design can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. And then finally, for you know, open top trays or any product that can't really be top lifted, uh, you're going to start to see these more tradition, um, these more complex um, grippers, like a platform style fork gripper, or a, a clamp style gripper, um, and these are types of things that you're going to see uh, used a bit more in the traditional industrial systems because with this type of mechanical complexity, uh, it just gets a little too heavy for a collaborative robot to be able to have any effective payload, um, you know, when using a, a gripper like that. Another thing with cobots is uh, around safety. So designing safety around a system like this, um, you can either have something that's going to be fully enclosed or a hybrid system um, that's still going to have an opening at the front for easy access. The benefit with enclosed or having even walls in some areas is you can actually shrink uh, the footprint a bit of the overall system. Because when you go to something that's fenceless um, with no you know, hard guarding, uh, you're actually able to uh, you actually have to have a separation distance from the robot that stays relatively clear. You can walk through it and the robot's just going to slow down. But obviously, if it's a high throughput area for, for humans and operators to go through, it might not be desirable to always have that triggered. Right? Um, although if you go slow enough, right, I think we mentioned about three to four cases per minute, uh, you could actually put in a system like this that has no safety whatsoever and it just runs at the same speed uh, all the time because the safety is built into the robot, assuming a risk assessment uh, has been done. So now in terms of evaluating a, a project uh, that uses a cobalt palletizer, so we've got uh, a handy return on investment calculator uh, that's free to use online on our website. Um, so just creating a very simple uh, example here, I've, I've just kind of cherry picked some of the parameters that are a little more relevant for a discussion. So creating a manual palletizing process that is a couple of shifts a day with one operator per shift. Um, for a line that does seven cases per minute with a worker efficiency of about 70%, for, so overall uh, labor, labor effectiveness. Uh, that gives you a line that's going to be able to produce a, around 4,500 cases per day, right, stacked manually. So how does that stack up with a cobot palletizing system? So an automated process using one of our Doosan cobot palletizers, which is about 150,000 US investment, depending on the configuration that you take, can be a bit more, can be a bit less. Same performance, seven cases per minute, but now with a 90% equipment efficiency, so uh, overall equipment effectiveness. Um, so that'll give you a line that can do up to 5,800 cases per day, just based on the higher effectiveness, right? So that's an increase, a bump of 22%. So something to keep in mind if you are going to be ramping up production or if you need that consistency. Uh, and you can actually get a payback um, of under a year, right? Even under 11 months in a situation like this. And depending on where you are and what the labor rates are locally, uh, that's that can actually change drastically, right? Can be a bit closer to 12 months, but that can go down to under nine months even in a lot of scenarios, right? So this is really a bit more of an average type example to show that a system like this is going to give you a payback um, that is indeed very attractive uh, at under a year in almost any scenario. Some other reasons uh, why you would want to go with uh, a cobalt palletizing system from a company such as Vention, um, you know, obviously you've got that, that great ROI justification, uh, but there are many advantages to getting a palletizer through a manufacturing automation platform. Uh, so because we use automated op modular components, uh, we keep all these in inventory, right? To build any custom project that folks have, but also for palletizing systems. So you get rapid deployment due to that. And just from a technological perspective, all of the tech that we've used and that we design and that we deploy has been designed to be easier and quicker to deploy. So just rapid, more rapid deployment across the board, right? We talk about days or weeks instead of weeks or months. 
at a manufacturing automation platform as well, uh, you have dedicated customer support teams. So it's not going to be dependent on an integrator and what projects they're working on, uh, depending on what bandwidth they're going to have there. We have dedicated customer support teams uh, that are always going to be there available to help with remote technical support. All right. Uh, the modular hardware also provides a you know, more than just rapid deployment, um, because there's over a thousand parts of modular hardware, you can customize actually your system, right? So if you need to add a bit of peripheral equipment here or change the layout a bit, maybe for the infeed or the enclosure, uh, you're able to do so extremely easily and very flexibly, right? And because our automation systems have been designed to be plug and play, uh, adding more components to the end of the line, right? We saw that example at the beginning uh, for line expansion, uh, you're gonna be able to just plug and play uh, and add more, all right? And then finally, cloud-based software for updates uh, is something as well um, that is provided to you using a manufacturing automation platform like Vention, always having the latest software. And just a couple of examples from the field. Uh, so here's a Doosan Cobalt palletizer in a fenceless configuration. Uh, we can see uh, the, the tape on the floor there that the customer puts just so that the operators would be mindful of where's the slowdown zone for the robot. They can enter it. There's no problem. The, ro the, the system keeps moving, uh, but it does slow down. So just if they're mindful of it, the system can keep uh, moving at full speed. And here's an enclosed configuration uh, using, again, a Doosan uh, Cobot, um, this time with a full enclosure around it. And the main driver here was just being able to have, uh, it was a very tight footprint with forklifts going by really in a, in a warehouse almost uh, environment at the end of this line. Um, so having this enclosed system actually was the only way to get the system in the footprint uh, that was available. That's the end of our webinar today, but we'll be taking uh, questions and answers over the chat at the moment. But thank you so much for sticking with us up until this point. Um, Patrick's been busy responding to people's questions already, so I'll just quickly go through those, those that haven't seen them already. Um, those are questions around you know, which brand of cobots uh, do we support here at Vention? So that would be Fanuc, Dusan, and Universal Robots. Um, there's a question around airflow pressure for cobot palletizers. And that's really dependent on the end of arm tooling that you do choose, but uh, Pat put some specifics there in the chat. Um, and then more specifically, um, you know, leasing options, yes, it's something that we can consider, um, but it is a little bit atypical of what our customers normally would do. And then the final question so far has been, can we use a system on two lines? And yes, uh, you can use that. Um, and you can have two and feed conveyors from separate lines going to two pallets. So that's um, a quick summary of everything so far, but I'd like to say thanks to you, Patrick, for recording that yesterday and, and listen to yourself for the last 30 minutes. Um, I know that's probably not the easiest thing to do. Yeah, it wasn't so bad. It's all right. <laughs> Good questions coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if anyone would like to, to instead just talk uh, or speak their question, you can just write that in the chat and I can enable that functionality for yourself as well. I'm sorry, I have to wear the mask. I'm in uh, an office setting, and where we are, we have to put uh, we have to keep our masks on at all times. So, Pat, we got a, a question in from Mark here. What supply do you utilize for your seventh axis or Cartesian gantry systems? Yeah, great question. So, um, there's two different types of seventh axis systems that we use on these these palletizers. Um, so, they're both vertical systems. So, one is the vertical gantry, uh, so a tall structure that'll move up and down. That is a vention system so a vention seventh axis so it's our structure and we used our um, enclosed lead screw actuator um, we have uh, we have two versions of that actuator a ball screw and a lead screw we use the lead screw on the vertical consider configuration because it's not back drivable and um, those those Doosan robots those well, especially the Doosan ones they go up to about 150 pounds uh, just the robot itself so we don't want that to drop um, so that's why we use an enclosed lead screw uh, and it is driven also by a vention control system uh, on the telescopic column side uh, that you see on the smaller cobots that is a telescopic column that we use from a, a partner company called Evelix um, so something that they call the lift kit uh, so that is an Evelix lift kit Mark, I hope that answers your questions. Please feel free to, to write a follow-up if, if it hasn't. Um, we'll just give it a, a, another minute or so. In the meantime, I'll write uh, Patrick's email into the chat here as well in case anyone would like to, 
to connect with him offline. Um, we'll be more than happy to have those conversations and, and answer any questions privately um, yeah, as they absolutely. come to mind. So we have one more from Jerome. In a demonstration context where the product and the throughput are not important, what covert brand um, would you recommend for this application? So assuming the product is not important, um, I'm gonna guess you mean that you know maybe the, the the shape and size and and form factor is you know we can use any gripping option possible. Um, I'm also gonna assume that payload I guess is not a concern. Obviously, above a certain payload, you're gonna be kind of driven by the type of robot that can reach the payload. Um, and finally, it's it's gonna really depend on a user in terms of what is the, uh, do they already have other robots within their facility that they use for other tasks, right? So you're, you're gonna see a lot of FANUX, for example. Um, some people already have large FANUX systems. Well, um, we'll use a FANUX cobot in those cases. If folks have universal robots, uh, we'll use universal robots in those situations. Um, for a cobot palletizer, let's say just like a small size, I find that the FANUX CRX is actually a great option uh, because you can, um, it, it can basically operate as an industrial robot um, if you shut off the safety using some of the safety IOs or the safety and logic, logic inside the robot. Um, so you're really gonna reach, uh, I mean, I'm assuming speed is relatively important. So you're, you are gonna be able to reach higher speeds uh, with a robot that is really rated to work uh, just like a, uh, an industrial system would. Um, so it is a very nice option. Um, and then when you're looking at heavier payloads, so stuff about, above about 18 pounds, 18, 20 pounds, like we saw, uh, we would recommend basically in all cases, the Doosan, uh, which will go up to about 50 pounds, right? Since it's really the only cobot that is able to go uh, within that range. And as far as gripping options go, um, assuming the, the product can be gripped with, without too many headaches, I'd, I'd basically always recommend something with foam. Um, it, it becomes a bit of an issue if you have too much porosity and the cardboard is not thick enough or can't hold its shape enough, right? If the box starts crowning, you're just going to lose the suction in, in your foam. But um, if that's not really a concern, foam is going to be the most versatile, right? You don't have to worry about having complete coverage with suction cups uh, and things like that. So a foam gripper is usually a pretty good option there. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Jerome, feel free to, to write a follow-up if you, if you have anything there. Pat, one thing you didn't actually touch on was lead time. Um, I was just interested in terms of typical lead time for a cobalt palletizing system like these. Yeah, sure. And maybe just to, to piggyback on my own answer from before, just around grippers and how to figure out uh, which ones to might be this, a suitable one. I know I think I mentioned that in, in the slide earlier, uh, but you can send your products to Vention um, and we have a validation testing uh, set up here. Um, so we'd be happy to kind of help you figure out what would be the best gripping option for you. Uh, and then as far as lead time goes, uh, for a standard configuration of, of the product, um, so not too many custom features, not too many custom, not too much custom peripheral equipment, uh, you're looking at about six to eight weeks um, just to get the whole cell, you know, pre-configured and then um, shipped over to you and installed on site. Uh, and then for something where there's going to be a little more customization, you're looking at probably a bit more like 10 to 12 weeks, right? So six to eight, eight weeks or something standard, 10 to 12 weeks for something a little more custom. All right, thanks. And um, we have one more from Mark, which user interface is more user-friendly in comparison to Fnook, Universal or Tucson? Yeah, great question, Mark. So actually the way the Vention palletizing system works is from a palletizing perspective, uh, you're actually using the same interface in all cases. Um, so it's actually a single unified interface, there, which is the Vention palletizing interface or, you know, the Vention cobot palletizing machine app, we call it. Uh, as far as programming the robots themselves, and you do have to go into those robots uh, to actually do some configuration. Um, th they're all pretty similar. Uh, they've all done a pretty good job of, of building new features on top of kind of these these traditional robots. Uh, Universal Robots in, has been around the longest. They've, they've got a pretty slick interface. It's not purpose-built for palletizing though. Um, Fanuc is gonna have a ton of different configuration options. Uh, you might need a little more experience to be able to dig down into all of the menus and all of the options, but if you're just using a pretty standard set of features, it's gonna be pretty similar as well. Uh, and Doosan is pretty similar to Universal Robots uh, in the sense that they're not gonna have, you know, you can't deep dive as much as with the Fanuc, uh, but they do a pretty good job as well as having something intuitive programming on the robot itself. 
Um, and one and more then, from Simon. Yeah. Yeah. Goes 50, 50 pounds. pounds. And the package are 55 pounds. Does it include the weight of the robot arm? So 55 pounds is about 24.9 kilos. Yeah, so that would be a little too heavy probably for uh, the Doosan, right? Because uh, yeah, that is the, the, if the total payload, including the gripper has to be under uh, 25 kilograms. So that 50 pounds that I showed was already kind of giving ourselves a bit of a buffer to, to keep for the gripper. Um, so at 55 pounds, uh, probably none of these cobot palletizers would be the, the right solution. You'd be looking at something either, either like an industrial robot palletizer or a, um, the Cartesian palletizer, like we saw before. Again, it's going to depend on throughputs and things like that. Uh, but at this time, there is no, uh, there is no cobot um, in that class uh, that's going to be able to, you know, there's just no gripper out there that's going to be light enough um, to lift something 55 pounds. Uh, it's, it, it would weigh a couple of kilograms or a few pounds at least. Uh, there are the Fennec uh, green robots uh, that could be considered. Um, they're somewhere between a, a collaborative robot and an industrial robot. Um, so that is something that could be considered. Although again, this, the safety considerations uh, are gonna remain kind of the same as you have for, for industrial robot palletizers in that case. So those would kind of be the options uh, for a 55 pound package would be either just a traditional system um, until a cobot comes out that just has a, a, a higher payload even, although they're probably not going to go much higher just because once you go high enough, it's not really collaborative anymore, no matter what you do, right? Just the risk of dropping something, whenever it moves faster than any useful speed, it's no longer collaborative anyways, just in terms of the inertia it has. Um, so yeah, traditional system or eventually Cartesian system uh, or that kind of like in between those, those green cobots, those green robots that Fennec has could be something to, to explore there as well. And just piggybacking off the back of your comments around gripper, I'll just put um, uh, a recent blog that we wrote around selecting the right gripper for your palletizer um, on the, in the chat section. So feel free to give that a read if you'd like. But I, I also had one last question jotted down and it was around um, deployment support and whether there is any on-site installation support well, with Vention or, or other um, custom integrators as well. Yeah, great question. So uh, when you get a Vention palletizer system, so you know an application um, like this, where we, we fairly well configured the entire system, uh, we are able to provide um, what we call a full deployment uh, service, so full, full deployment bundle. So we have an applications delivery team that will do some pre-assembly, pre-configuration, pre-validation at Vention. Uh, we'll ship over the system and then we will install it uh, on site for you guys. Uh, we do also have channel partners um, for in, uh, in our certified system integrators that are able to assist with this. I think I saw a couple of them on the call actually, uh, but yes, we do offer um, on site uh, installation and commissioning support. All right. We had uh, another question from James just around the, the maximum weight. Um, so I'll let you read and have a think about that. And um... Right. So if we have, uh, if if we're if we're right on the nose of uh, of the payload, um, I would say you're going to be fine. Probably, um, it's it's going to be more around the speed uh, of the system that you're going to be able to achieve. Because if you're if you're really running on the limit, and the robot has like very sudden moves and things like this, and it starts vib vibrating, just that vibration, either in the robot or the structure, or, you know, the actual gripper, maybe um, that might be enough to trigger uh, a fault on the robot. And it's, uh, it might not even be its collaborative function, safety monitoring function. It might just be like a, a, a torque overload at one of the joints of the robot, right? Um, so if, if usually when we get to something that's that close um, and we've done all the other validations, we're probably just going to test it uh, and see and see what kind of results we get. But I, uh, we're usually pretty confident that even if we're on that limit, right, it's usually a pretty good estimate that we're going to be able to do it. So we'll just give it another couple of minutes uh, to see if, if anyone has any other questions. But I have to take the time to thank you, Pat, for um, putting together the video and everything yesterday, given the circumstances, and then joining the call again today. So I know it's not the easiest um, situations to put together a webinar, but uh, I certainly enjoyed it, and I'm sure everyone on the call did as well. So, so thank you very much. My pleasure. We get snowstorms here in Montreal, so... It's uh, it adds a whole other set of challenges. <laughs>
Okay. Well, I think um, the chat is slowing down, so I think we'll we'll end it there. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time um, and for for joining the webinar. If you did have any other questions, feel free to reach out to um, pretty much anyone in Vention um, and they'll get back to you or you can reach out to Patrick directly. Um, and these slides will be up on demand uh, on our web webinar page in the resources section on our website later this afternoon. So feel free to go have another watch and um, you can see all of his contact details within that video. Bye for now. Thanks everyone. Thanks for all your questions. Have a good day.